Hi, everyone. We're going to be getting started in just one minute, so please come in and take a seat uh, and feel, feel free to bring your lunch. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Maureen Conway uh, to our, our conversation um, in our Opportunity in America series, Measure What Matters, Realigning Measures of Economic Success with Societal Well-Being. <clears throat> uh, the Economic Opportunities Program works to advance promising policy strategies and ideas to help low and moderate income people in the United States connect to opportunity and thrive in a changing economy <clears throat> and as part of our work, we host the Opportunity in America series to really bring together a variety of voices around um, what's happening for, for ordinary people in today's economy. Uh, we bring together researchers, policymakers, business leaders, labor leaders, philanthropy leaders, and more um, to discuss particular issues and to talk about the challenges facing people and ideas for change. Um, and today's uh, conversation on measures, you know, I think is a really important and timely one. Uh, most of the measures we keep hearing about in the news regarding our economy indicates uh, it's doing pretty well. The stock market is reaching new highs, unemployment is low, uh, GDP continues to grow. And, um, but it seems like also when you read the news, these numbers don't necessarily reflect the reality that many families in the United States are facing. Uh, families who are dealing with stagnant wages, rising expenses, and particularly limited opportunities to get ahead. Uh, so why do our measures of economic health seem kind of disconnected from people's sense of economic well-being? Uh, do these measures provide adequate information and guidance for policymakers, for business leaders? Uh, how do they inform um, consumers, uh, workers, and just and voters about how they think about the economy, um, and how do they influence people's behavior? Uh, as a saying goes that we're fond of in the Economic Opportunities Program, what gets measured gets managed. So do we need some new measures to kind of direct our attention to what needs to be managed in today's economy? So today we'll talk about inequality in our economic divides, what we know, what we need to know, um, one thing we do know is that economic opportunities are not evenly distributed. Race, ethnicity, gender, and geography play an outsized influence in uh, the experiences of individuals and families in the United States. Um, and these economic divides and how they cut across the issues of race, gender, and place, they've been a long uh, concern and something that we focus on in the Economic Opportunities Program. But uh, it's not just our program that thinks about them. We share this with many others working in the Aspen Institute. Um, and I just want to recognize that in organizing today's event, we worked with our colleagues in the Ascend program, the financial, uh, financial security program, and the program on philanthropy and social innovation here at the Aspen Institute. Um, and I'm just really deeply grateful to my colleagues for their partnership and support um, as we thought about today's event and as we think about so much of the work we do here at the Aspen Institute. Um, all of us are really excited to bring together this group of experts to um, talk about how to measure our economy and economic health and how to address our economic divides and build an inclusive economy. As I mentioned, this conversation is part of our Opportunity in America series. Uh, we are extremely grateful to the Ford Foundation, Walmart.org, Prudential Financial, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of this series. We could not do it without their support. Um, now, I do want to remind people that we are live streaming today's event. So please, if you have your phone with you, please do silence it. But please do also join the conversation on Twitter. Our hashtag 
is talk good jobs. No, it's not. Our hashtag is talk opportunity. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so today's, uh, today's event is in three parts. Uh, we'll begin with an with a opening presentation from uh, Heather Boucher on her most recent book. Here it is. Uh, Unbound, How Inequality Constricts Our Economy and What We Can Do About It. Um, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't bought it, do so. I encourage you to read it. Um, it's, a, it's a very readable, accessible book that summarizes an amazing amount of research uh, and uh, really um, makes that just uh, come alive. Um, so uh, I encourage you to buy it. You'll learn a lot. I did. Um, uh, so uh, after we hear from we hear from Heather, we're going to have a panel conversation, and Heather will be joined uh, by Sapna Mehta from Groundwork Collaborative and Daniel Alpert from Westwood Capital, um, and then we'll be sure to leave some time uh, for question and answer from all of you. We want really wanted to engage you in the conversation, and for people live streaming, you can also tweet questions using the hashtag TalkTheOpportunity. Um, so, and now I'm, it's just my pleasure to introduce Heather Boucher, co-founder, president, CEO of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Um, Heather is a brilliant economist, author, influential leader in economic policy, um, and has built an important organization here in DC. Uh, but one of the things I also just want to mention is, not only has Heather done amazing research and writing herself, but she's really directed um, research and, and, and really built a community of scholars that are uh, focused on this issue of, of, of uh, inequality and really built an important body of scholarship and an important community of voices that are talking about it and thinking about it and driving to uh, new solutions to address this problem. So um, uh, I just want to give her credit for that because it's really uh, quite remarkable what Heather has accomplished. And uh, so please join me in welcoming Heather Boucher. Um, that, uh, thank you, and I'm so glad that you um, talked about the community we're building at Equitable Growth. Um, what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes um, about this new book that came out in October is really the learning um, that the organization that I uh, launched um, with uh, many other people in November of 2013, what we've learned from it over the past six years about the new research evidence about whether and how inequality affects our economy. And um, I'm going to end with some policy recommendations that go direct to this question that Maureen kind of asked us about, um, you know, whether or not we need new measures. And um, I think the resounding conclusion of the research we've been doing, um, and one of the key conclusions of my book, is yes, please, we need new measures. And I'm going to give you a bit of a preview of um, my favorite new measure that we've been working hard on at Equitable Growth. Um, so I'm going to try to stick to just a few minutes here. Um, I'm very excited to share this research, and sometimes I get a little wrapped up in um, talking about different pieces and then realize that I've gone on too long. And then the more that you look at me and look like you're really fascinated, the longer I'll talk. So if you get bored, just <laughs> feel free to start looking down or like you're falling asleep, and I'll stop talking. Um, it's actually quite good. Also, just fun fact, talking to senators is the best audience ever because they all look like they're madly in love with you, and they're like so wrapped in everything you say, even though I'm sure they're not even thinking about what you're talking. Maybe they are. Um, but just noting, we should all strive for that. So um, uh, at Equitable Growth, we seek to understand whether and how economic inequality in all of its forms affects um, economic growth and stability. And um, we seek to, to use that research to advance evidence-backed ideas and policies so that we can have an economy where growth is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And we've been doing this, as Maureen said, through funding research and engaging a community of scholars. Over the past six years, we've given away over five and a half million dollars to over 200 scholars nationwide. And as we've been looking at the research and evidence coming from economics and coming from across other social sciences, we've come to a few conclusions. And that's what I want to um, talk for a few minutes with you about today. One is that um, due to the fact that um, researchers now have access to so much data, that they didn't have access to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. The profession, um, economic research, is much more empirically grounded. And 
scholars are much better able to evaluate questions of what we as researchers would call heterogeneity, what lay people would call just differences across or within groups, much more able to look at that because we have the data and we have the computing power and we have methods that allow us to show causality. So there's been a lot of um, sort of technological reasons um, why things have changed in economics. Once you start looking at this data and evidence, it becomes clear that, at least in my view and the view of my colleagues at Equitable Growth, that economics is in the middle of what I think is a paradigm shift. There are a lot of scholars who are sort of in the very classic Thomas Kuhnian sense, are finding things that are sort of at the boundaries of the accepted um, uh, realm of scientific inquiry that, that aren't consistent with our prior theoretical understanding of what makes the economy grow, what's going to create the kinds of economic outcomes that we want. And so it's an incredibly exciting time in economics. Um, I feel like it is the most exciting time in my career because there are so many things that are coming out that really are making us question our prior assumptions. And the book is really a culmination of our learning about this. So um, I want to just start, uh, and I know here in, um, uh, in DC, uh, uh, a lot of you know about the data. I'm going to spend a couple minutes just looking at some of the grounding data about inequality to make sure we're all on the same page for the whole conversation we're going to have over the next hour, an hour and a half. A little bit about what we're learning from the evidence, and then um, a little bit on policy recommendations. I do want to get right to the spoiler alert on the policy recommendations. You can have this in your head as I'm going through what I'm about to say. Once you start looking at the research and evidence, uh, it becomes clear that unless we think about policies that constrain inequality um, at the very top and provide um, ways that you create counterweights to the ways that concentrated economic power looks like in the economy and the ways that it translates into social and political power, unless you do both of those things, you are not going to undo the constricting and downward pull of inequality on economic outcomes. So that is sort of the meta framework that I think we should be thinking about policy moving forward. So um, with that, let me just go through a few economic, um, just a couple of slides here. So first, I'm going to show, and this is all based in the United States, um, and these are supposed to be emblematic. So don't get too hung up on the, I mean, on the details. Um, happy to send the slides. Happy to show you the papers. Um, none of the research in the book is my own research, so I'm not totally attached to any single study and may not know all the ins and outs of it. But really, it's, it's showing sort of what we're learning from economics. So this first figure is from research by Piketty, Saez, and Zuckman, looking at the um, income distribution in the United States. This is the decades of the 60s and 70s, so from 1963 to 79. On the x-axis is the income distribution in the United States. On the y-axis is income growth. And um, the purple line is average national income growth. And so um, national income in the national income and product accounts is virtually the same thing conceptually to, um, or for these purposes, to gross domestic product. So when I say national income, you can kind of think of, oh, that's the measure of what we're making, the incomes that are earned in our economy. Um, so what this shows you is in those decades of the 60s and 70s, we were a country that was growing together. We were also a country where when essentially GDP, national income, grew over the course of a year or a quarter, the vast majority of Americans benefited from that growth at about the same rate. So about two-thirds of people saw their incomes grow within about 10% uh, of the average over these decades. And low-income people saw their incomes grow faster than the average, and high-income people saw their incomes grow slower. So if you listen to the news reports and you heard that GDP was 3% back in 1969, you would know, you would be able to know that, wow, okay, 3%. That means low-income people were seeing growth of maybe a little bit more, maybe 4%. High-income people seeing growth a little less. But most of us all had in our incomes growing at about 3%. We were growing together. There have been a number of significant changes in the data and evidence since these decades. Um, the first, and this one we do not talk about enough, national income is slower. So when you go and you think about the decades from 1963 to 79, Average national income growth was 1.7%. Since 1980, it's only 1.3%. And so as you're going about your day and your work and you're thinking about policy, I strongly encourage you to start with the question, why would growth be slower than it was in earlier decades? That should be our, pri our starting point. Rather than what have we been doing so right in the economy, there's, there should be some questions about what were we doing right before that we aren't doing now. 
um, or what have we changed since 1980? There's some hints there in what I'm saying, but that we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, so there's two other big changes on the income side. Um, so this chart is 1980 to 2016. You can see it's a very different picture. First, we are a nation that is growing apart. When the economy grows, lowest income people see the smallest amount of growth and high income people see the highest amount of growth. We're literally growing apart. Um, and it's extreme growth at the very top. And then second, the average now means virtually nothing. Because if you hear that GDP in the fourth quarter of 2019 was 3% or whatever it is, we'll just say 3%, what that really means if it were 3% is that the top 10% of people saw their incomes grow by a lot more than 3%, 5, 6, maybe 10%, and everybody else saw their incomes grow by something less than that. So now when we, when we get that data and the National Income and Project Account data that gives us the GDP, it's data that was compiled in the 1930s, we adopted GDP as an international indicator really when the OECD was founded in the 1960s and we all across countries started looking at it. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's not telling us anything useful about the economy if you actually care about what the economy looks like across a society. And, if, and, um, and, it's, and that's very, very different than in decades past. If you, I mean, there's so many other ways to look at this change in what's happened across the United States. We are a nation which, with much less upward mobility. Used to be the case if you're born, you know, in the 1940s or so, nine out of 10 people grew up to out earn their parents. Among those born in the early 80s, only about half of them are now out earning their parents, and those trends are going down. I'm sure it's less than half now um, once we start getting data for more recent cohorts. Um, alongside high income inequality, we're seeing high wealth inequality. Um, families at the very top are, have seen their incomes grow by almost 300% since 1989 while families in the bottom half, their wealth is just back to where it was in 1989. No increase in their wealth for the bottom half of the US, and in no small part that's due to the financial crisis. Um, but it's also a, a long-term stagnation in the trends. And then the other inequality trend that is intimately connected to the trends on income and on wealth and mobility is the fact that we are a nation where we have an increasing economic concentration across firms. This affects um, the rents that people at the very top of the income and wealth ladders experience as, um, uh, as concentration affects um, equity prices and dividend payouts and the rents that are experienced in those monopolies. It's also um, a factor that is pulling down wages. And there's a lot of new empirical research that shows that right, this, this um, high concentration we have now is actually lowering investment in the United States or is a culprit behind lower investment, which then means we don't have the productivity growth, which means that we don't have the bandwidth for the kind of wage growth that we would like to see. Um, so the rising economic concentration across firms is intricately connected to this and is also something that we need to start thinking about in our stories about inequality and how we're measuring economic success. So um, at Equitable Growth, what we've been doing is saying, OK, so we have all these different trends in inequality. So what does it mean? How do we understand how this should change our understanding of the economy? Is this something we should worry about? Or is it just this is sort of the natural state of affairs? Why should we care if people at the very, very top are getting these high incomes? Maybe they're, they're just investing it, and that's improving productivity for all, which I just sort of said maybe it's probably not. That's a hint. Um, or you know, maybe, maybe we, but maybe we shouldn't care, right? Is there, are there economic reasons to care above and beyond fairness? And so our research program for six years has been dedicated to understanding that question. And um, what I do in the book is I summarize, and I, I try to think, I, I hope that I have done it in a way that doesn't really feel like a literature review. In each chapter, I take a, an economist or a scholar whose research is emblematic of what we have been learning. I interviewed them, so there's some like pithy quotes from them, um, and really tell the story of what we're learning from the most cutting edge research about how inequality is constricting growth. So that really is the headline there. And um, there's three ways that we see inequality affecting growth. First, easiest for us to wrap our heads around, I dare say here at Aspen, where I know you have a lot of different programs that think about this issue, this is a yes, well, we know that, right? We know that higher inequality means that some children don't have, economic, don't have opportunities because of the neighborhood they live in, because of the schools they go to, because of the fact that they don't have access to early um, childhood education or pre-K, or maybe they grew up in a neighborhood that is um, 
exposed to a lot of air pollution because they live near a highway and this is affecting um, fetal development and that is affecting lifetime employment and earnings and outcomes. There's all of this rich bodies of research and evidence that shows the way that inequality is affecting both the development of human capital and the deployment of human capital. Um, just one study that I think, to my mind, um, really illustrates this very vividly um, on the deployment side is the research, and we um, helped fund this work, so, and uh, Raj Chetty was a founding uh, member of our steering committee. Um, he and his colleagues wanted to understand what drives innovation in America, who becomes an innovator, and um, because, because that is really what drives growth, right? Ultimately, it is sort of the new ideas and the, and the deployment of talent and those ideas into the economy that's going to propel an economy forward. So we wanted to understand the effect of inequality on this. So they got data on all the people who applied for and received a patent. And they knew about that person's income and employment outcomes as an adult. And they matched that data to those people's third grade test scores and the people's income and demographics when they were in third grade. So now they had a measure, an independent measure, of somebody's aptitude for becoming an innovator. Or so, you know, so they wanted to sort of test that. So the first thing they do is they said, okay, what does this look like? And they found that kids that do really, really well, that score in the highest part of the distribution on third grade math standardized tests are much more likely to grow up and, and get a patent and become an inventor. And totally, you know, that seems to me like a common sense finding, but they were able to show that. Okay, so now you know like what kinds of people are likely in general to grow up and become an innovator. And so they just look at the kids that scored the highest on those third grade math test scores. And they found that kids from the highest income backgrounds, four times as likely than other children to grow up and become an innovator. And so they call this paper the lost Einsteins, because they are documenting that our economy is being dragged down by the lack of innovation and the productivity gains that that would be bringing because there are all of these children who somewhere along the way are denied the opportunity to find a job that, that, get, that provides them with the best fit in the economy and to contribute in the economy and to become an innovator. And um, you know, this isn't just about the fairness for that child and that child's trajectory. It also means that there are lots of things that are not being invented that would serve different consumer groups, right? One might hypothesize that people in low income or moderate income communities might um, invent different things, right? They might have different things that they think are important to their communities or different ideas that they would want to invent. It might be the case that women would invent different things than men. It might be the case that black and Hispanic people will say, oh, I've got different things I want to invent that serve my community or, or tap into my life experiences. So we actually then have this diminishment in the kinds of goods and services that are available in the economy because we've cut off that flow of ideas, which is another way that it drags down our economy. So to my mind, this study really sort of encapsulates it, but I want to just stress this is just one of literally hundreds, if not thousands, of research data points that together really lead to this conclusion that inequality is obstructing the supply of people and ideas into the economy. The second way that we see inequality affecting growth is through, the, uh, through subverting the institutions that manage the market, making our political system dysfunctional and our markets ineffective. I think I actually just switched those from the slide there. Um, you can see this you know, throughout um, the economy. You, know, you think about what happened in 2017 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Poll after poll shows that the American public would like to see us um, as a country doing more investment in things like public education or infrastructure or just public investment more generally. Yet, we are not doing that. And in fact, in the United States, our tax revenue as a share of GDP has fallen to historic lows. It's about 15% or so now, or will be soon. And um, that is much, much lower than our competitors and much lower than where it was just a few years ago. Um, and the 2017 Tax Cut, tax, tax cut and Jobs Act um, was a bill that was um, unpopular with the public before it went into law unpopular with the public after it went into law and is limiting our ability to make these investments. That's a massive subversion of our political process if the will of the majority is not sort of working its way through the economy. And there's a lot of evidence that the reason that that law and other things um, like that that pass is that it has to do with the ways that economic polarization is affecting our politics. 
We also see this playing out in the ways that monopolies are using their power in the economy to affect the rules in the industries that they um, exist in. So making our markets not work the way a competitive market should. Finally, inequality constricts growth by distorting demand through its effects on both consumption and investment. So I already noted that there is evidence now that um, a lot of new research and evidence is showing that the rise in inequality, and particularly the rise in concentration across firms, is lowering investment in the United States. You're also seeing that the rise in wealth, which one might think would lead to more investment because there's all these rich people with all this money. In fact, there's a series of new papers that are showing, actually, that's not happening. The rise in wealth concentration, as it flows its way through the financial industry, is actually increasingly making its way into um, loans to households rather than loans to businesses or other sorts of financing for investment, which is both addressing the consumption effects and is also ultimately destabilizing and is not improving necessarily productivity. So that was a lot of economics. I'm going to just move on to um, just to concluding. Um, so as we've gone through the research um, over the past few years and come to these conclusions, um, we've sort of thought about what are the really important policies that we need to do to address this. And it's a big list. Um, we need to change the way that we enforce our antitrust provisions. We need to think about how we tax capital. Um, we need to think about counterweights to concentrated economic power, whatever those are. But um, there's a lot of new ideas that just came out last week from the Clean Slate, the Clean Slate Agenda project um, that give people the right to bargain collectively and all the different ways that we want uh, workers to have a voice at work and in our society. Those are just some ideas. Um, but those are all big, very hard things. And I'm very glad today we're going to talk about measurement because I actually think there are very powerful ways we can update our measures that show that give people a sense that these kinds of conclusions that we're coming to are um, where we should be thinking um, about finding answers for our policy uh, challenges. So we want to measure what matters. And um, we have been looking specifically at GDP in, um, at equitable growth. So this is just, and you don't need to read the little fine print here. That's not the point. If you just look at the little chart, the little orange here, um, this is what the Bureau of Economic Analysis, this is a copy of the report that they release each quarter when they give us the new data from the National Income and Product Accounts. And at the, and at the front, they have a little chart on what GDP is, because that's the headline. So when they release GDP, if you go, if you watch the news, or if, you, if you're in a hotel or you go to a gym or something and there's like 22 televisions, all the televisions will be like, oh, GDP was this or that. And there'll be all these people on the television telling you that it means something about the economy. And so they'll be talking about these numbers, right? And they'll be talking about this in the aggregate as though, and I showed you those numbers at the beginning, as though that meant something. We've been working with the BEA and with Congress to, to get the BEA to do something that would actually look like this. So instead of having these aggregate numbers, these boxes, you actually disaggregate it. So these show the gold is the bottom 40%, the blue is the middle 50%, the next 9%, and then the, this purple or whatever color this is, mauve, um, is the top 1%. So instead of just saying, oh, well, growth was uh, 3% in the second quarter of 2017, here it says, okay, well, growth was 3%, but of that, a full percentage point, so a third of it, went to the top 1%. So of the gains that our economy experienced in that time period, a third of them went to 1% of the people, right? If things were sort of being equitably distributed, the top 1% would get 1% of the growth, right? And if it, this was the 60s and 70s, they would have gotten less than 1% based on that chart that I showed you. But that's not what's happening. So imagine what those 22 television sets and all those talking heads would be discussing if they actually had to look at this instead of looking at this. So we would be having a very different conversation about economic performance that showed us, that connected the dots between the aggregate and what's happening to people all across the United States. I will end there. And I've gone on, yeah, probably too long. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you. And now we get to go this way. I guess because uh, we have our little step here, so nobody trips. Oh, is Sapna supposed to be? All right, sorry, I'm doing this in the wrong order. And then you got it. Okay, dang. All right. So thank you. That was fabulous. Um, 
And uh, so now we get to have uh, a little bit more of a conversation. And so I am just going to um, quickly mention who's joining us on the, on the stage here. Um, to my far left um, is uh, Sapna Mehta, Director of Public Policy and Research at Groundwork Collaborative. Um, and next to Sapna is uh, Daniel Alpert, Managing Director at Westwood Capital, um, and Heather and I'm Maureen Conway again. Um, and uh, you have, um, you know, biomaterials, so I don't want to uh, belabor that. I'm going to sort of let them kind of introduce themselves as, as well, but do take a look at their bios because they're all quite accomplished. Um, uh, so uh, you have that available to you. Um, but uh, Heather's just covered a lot of ground in a little time. Uh, well done. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's uh, so, um, uh, just kind of jump in. And Sapna, I'm going to start with you. Um, and maybe you could just uh, tell us a little bit briefly about Groundwork and sort of how Groundwork thinks about some of these issues of economic measurement. And, and also maybe just um, you could tell us a little bit about how you kind of came into this work and, and why you are kind of doing what you're doing. So Sapna, let me just let you start. Yeah, so thank you, Maureen, and to the Economic Opportunities Program for having me here today. It's really great to be here with Heather and Dan. Um, at Groundwork, we are dedicated to advancing a coherent, persuasive narrative around the economy. And our shorthand for this narrative is we are the economy. That means that everyday people, people of color, working people, um, folks with disabilities are at the center of our economy, and our economy is only working when it works for most of us. Um, and when the economy is working for those who have been excluded or left behind, that's going to benefit everyone. Um, and as Maureen mentioned earlier, um, you know, the current data released landscape of unemployment, um, you know, GDP, the stock market, these just aren't accurate measures of how most people are faring in the economy. We, and so at Groundwork, we're really interested in finding and developing um, you know, new economic metrics that do a better job at capturing the human side of the economy. Um, for me personally, you know, I came into this work because both of my parents work in, in healthcare and growing up in Northeast Ohio, I really saw what the lack of healthcare meant for families. You know, folks are wearing out their bodies, working two to three jobs, um, you know, to put food on the table, to put their children um, through school, you know, and they couldn't afford critical medications like insulin. They're forced to like skip, um, you know, critical checkups. If someone had an emergency, you know, and they had to go to the ER, if they couldn't pay, the hospital then, you know, could garnish their wages. Um, you know, and I saw that happen, and I saw how it devastated families. Um, you know, and it just didn't make sense to me at this, you know, that in this country of, of supposed opportunity, um, you know, that folks didn't, and they still don't, have access to quality, affordable health care. And that means that something is really wrong, um, you know, with the way that our society and economy functions. Great, thank you, Sapna, and it's great. Um, I really appreciate that story, and I also appreciate you sort of making the connection of sort of the quality of people's jobs to the quality of, of their lives. And it's a it's a good lead in to sort of uh, asking a question to to Dan of uh, you know job quality is something that we've been grappling with in the Economic uh, Opportunities Program for for quite a while now, and um, so I'm just going to take a little moderator's privilege and, and make a plug because we just uh, yesterday opened a, a survey of sort of organizations working in communities, um, asking them about how they think about job quality and what kinds of things they might be doing to influence job quality in their community. Uh, AS.pn slash job quality survey if you are interested. Um, so. Uh, uh, but I was really just excited. I immediately had to sort of track Dan down when I sort of saw hit the introduction of the job quality index and sort of say, wow, that's amazing. Um, so, so before we get into the details of the job quality index, though, like maybe you could just tell us a little bit what inspired you to yeah, sort, sort of get into this and just do so this work. Shameless plug, jobqualityindex.com. There you go. She did it. I can do it. Of course. <laughs> um, so, 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 you know, around about 2005, uh, I was about 48 years old, 25 years, quarter century on Wall Street, and suddenly decided that I had absolutely no idea how business was being conducted. Mm -hmm. People were trading CDOs, creating ridiculous mortgage securities. I thought I had aged out and just didn't understand what was going on anymore. Um, as it turned out, it wasn't me. It was them. And, and uh, so I started writing around 2007 um, and then worked uh, for a number of years uh, producing white papers on various subjects, large scale uh, macroeconomic analyses that actually, I think, pretty much came into the mainstream 
uh, explaining what happened and how all that capital ended up uh, going in the wrong places. Um, and that, of course, you know, led to a book, and that lead, leads to other things. You know, as you start to write more, you get more invitations to write. Um, and what, one of the things that uh, bothered me enormously in the early years of this uh, so-called recovery is that we weren't seeing the type of rotation that we would typically see from low-wage, low-hour jobs into higher-paying jobs. And in every other you know, uh, uh, type of recovery, with the sole exception maybe of the 2000s, right? We would, we would typically see, and especially a very severe uh, recession, we would typically see a rotation period. It would take a few years, right? You'd create some aggregate demand, and that demand would filter through, and it would create better jobs. Um, and this wasn't happening, and it was starting to really stump me. Now, I, I have to add one side thing, and that is that my general theory is that we have two forces in effect in the U.S. economy and all advanced economies. One is a prevailing uh, continuation of a 40-year austerity uh, condition, which is uh, politically induced. And the other one, sort of fortuitous, meaning having absolutely nothing to do with the other, is this massive uh, 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 emergence of the post-socialist economies uh, and you know, three and a half billion people out there as an exogenous labor force effectively uh, uh, devaluing domestic labor. So I started looking at the data, and I actually started monitoring it every month. And I, you, know, you don't have the tools that you need if you're doing a, a, a big project to do this on your own. And I started with a few sectors just to watch uh, the data. And as it turned out, um, the low-wage, low-hour sectors continued to form more jobs, a lot more jobs, than, uh, than, than, than what you would have expected. This led to the conclusion that we were kind of not only stuck in a rut, uh, but we were uh, moving into a, a completely different paradigm in which our economy was truly unable to generate the type of high-wage, high-hour jobs that we would have expected. Great. Um, thank you. Mm. So, uh, Heather, I just want to uh, give you a, a chance here. I've asked them to sort of share a little bit both about their personal story as well as their organization. Um, and I know you have a lot of personal passion around some economic justice work. And I'm just curious if there's a piece that you'd like to share about some of the things that, that drive you on a more personal level. Well, I. Um... I mean, I feel like I, I shared a little bit, but I mean, I think that just this, I, I think what's, what is, uh, one of the things that I think is common across all of us up here on the stage today is a real um, hunger to understand what's happening um, and why our economy no longer delivers the way that it used to and, and how it can deliver for people in a different way. Um, and I think that that is, it's worth sort of, uh, just sort of stepping in, back and noting that this is a question that people are asking all across the country, and it's both experts and also people on the ground. Um, we've been working with economists and um, policy thought leaders, and we pulled together a group of um, uh, thought leaders about a year and a, maybe a little over a year ago now, um, about 25 folks, um, all sort of um, of the sort of up and coming generation. And it was really striking to me how, um, what happened during the financial crisis when these folks were getting out of school was really the driver for um, trying to understand what's happening and what went wrong. And I think it's also worthy of note that that is also your driver, Pretty as much. you just described, um, to, to understanding you know, what, what has happened. I think just one on a substance point, mm -hmm. not on a personal point, I do think it's interesting when you look at the research and evidence that you know, that the financial crisis, um, although it might have felt like the, like that that was a tipping point in the economy, I think what we're learning from the research and evidence is that tipping point was actually put in place decades before, and the financial crisis was a symptom. And so both trying to understand how, what that particular cause was, but the other things that have shifted really since 1980, I think is where we need to be searching um, for, for answers. And I will end with a personal note um, that you know, for me personally, uh, I grew up in uh, Washington State, and my dad was a machinist at um, the Everett Boeing plant where they made the Boeing 747s. And um, in the early 80s recession, myself and all the other little kids at my bus stop were laid off. And my, not the kids, their parents, not the children, <laughs> their parents. Um, but it felt that way. And, you know, as a little kid, I was really um, struck by how much power that firm had. 
Okay. And now I know as an economist that those years that I was sort of wondering, wow, what is going on, really were this tipping point in the economy. Right. And you know, you sort of trace the, trace the arc of how business has changed, how policy has changed. These are just questions that I think are, um, they're so important to our well-being. Yeah, great, thank you. And I love you started with that hunger to understand because I think you know, uh, you all have been taking some innovative looks at things. And I think, Sapna, some of the work you've been doing um, is really interesting. Um, you've been doing this work on inflation inequality, which is was sort of a new term for me um, and maybe new to, to other folks here. So I was hoping you could just sort of tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, what inflation equality, inequality is and also, but why is, it, why is it important? Like, how does that affect sort of other measures that we that we look at, like mm -hmm. the poverty rate? Yeah. So um, at Groundwork, we actually, um, you know, we were looking at a, a paper commissioned by the Washington Center for Equitable Growth that found that prices rise more quickly for people at the bottom of the income distribution than at the top. Um, and so that's a phenomenon known as inflation inequality. Um, because there is more money at the top, you know, companies find it more profitable to actually compete for dollars at the top of the income distribution than at the bottom. And so this means that high-income households have more choices than low-income um, and low- and middle-income households. So the idea that um, you know, business competition and a competitive market um, are holding down prices is really more relevant to the experience um, of upper-income households than lower-income households. Um, so for example, like, um, one of the examples that actually the author of this paper gives is that in the case of craft beer, new varieties of craft beer are, are consistently being produced. And this, increases, um, this increase in competition keeps inflation low for existing varieties of craft beer, while competition is more stable for mass-produced beer, like, I don't drink beer, um, like Budweiser, <laughs> um, you know, res like resulting in higher inflation for those products. Um, and so I think what we, at Groundwork, what we found particularly um, fascinating is that it's not just that inflation is not uniform across all income groups, but that income inequality is so high that it's the root cause. And so that means that we're underestimating the true levels um, of income inequality and poverty, um, since both are measured using uniform inflation rates um, that do not account for the faster price increases uh, faced by low and middle income households. So um, we worked with um, Dr. Xavier Javarel, who's the original economist who, who wrote about inflation inequality um, and research at the Columbia Center for um, Poverty and Social Policy to figure out what inflation and inflation inequality might mean for some of our most, most basic economic metrics. And so we found that adjusted for inflation and inflation inequality, there are at least 3.2 million more people um, in poverty in 2008 than the official metrics suggest. Um, so that's more than the entire population of the state of Iowa. Um, and household income for the bottom 20% declined by nearly 7% from 2004 to 2018, rather than the 1% decline um, as reported in the official statistics. So that means that income inequality um, between the top and the bottom quintiles grew by more than 20%, which is a more than 33% increase from the official statistics. Um, and I guess, you know, while incomes for, for low and middle income families declined, incomes for the rich continued to grow, right? So widening the gap between the rich and everyone else. Um, and so at Groundwork, you know, I think what, again, like what kind of interested us is in this new data is that it tells a story about how low and middle income families are experiencing the economy, right? Because economic, economic inequality is it's bad for our families, it's bad for our broader economy, because um, as Heather explained, right, economic growth has slowed. Um, and so the, if the economy is not doing well, like we are all not doing well, and the econ economy just can't be strong um, if all this wealth you know, continues to accrue at the top. Um, we also know that this really resonates with working people. People know that they aren't receiving nominal wage increases, um, let alone a real wage increase. You know, they know that things are getting more expensive while their wages remain stagnant. Um, just, you know, for example, I used to organize airport workers in Chicago, and, you know, I remember the baggage handlers hadn't seen a raise in 10 years. Um, you know, and theirs is not a unique story. Um, it's, it's happening, um, you know, to working people in communities across the U.S., um, and I think like this is something really tangible that that also resonates um, with folks. Great. 
Did you yeah, oh yeah, can I? Um, so uh, we, we had, this is such an exciting study. Which, uh, was one of our grantees early on, and I just wanted to point out one connection to a point that I made that might have been a little opaque for people who don't really think about the macro economy, because one of the really interesting things about this research is that it shows the ways um, helps it helps you see the way that inequality is not just distorting how people are spending, but that that is feeding its way through investment. And that, that, you know, we have these stories in our head all the time about what's going to be good for the economy, right? And I think a lot of times we have in our imagination, we're sort of thinking of this chop down the street or something, right? The small business or something where it's like, oh, well, if we keep the costs low for that business, then they're just going to invest and then they'll they'll hire more people, they'll keep those people on. We have the, and it's that's a very, if you know anybody that owns a business, like these are basic, you know, questions that people ask. And yet this research really underscores that it is that you have to think about not just those incentives in terms of costs, but what kinds of customers people are looking at. And so you so, so the economy has never been just this cost story, but it's hard to kind of put all that together in our head at one time. And I think that um, Yarabel's research and the work that Groundwork has done to elevate that really does show how the shift in who is buying things and what they can afford is affecting what firms are investing in and what they're making in ways that is having these multiplicative effects across our economy. And so I look forward to Groundwork helping us to make sense of that in ways that are just as pithy and just as easy as thinking of the shop down the street. But we need to re, and so part of how we need to change what measures is to reformulate that understanding. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Dan, I want to come to you next so that you can sort of say a little bit more about the, sure. the job quality index and kind of give us an overview of that. So, you know, uh, folks like myself and, and Heather and Savna, we think in quintiles probably dream in deciles, right? Uh, and, and, <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, and, and it's all very, very interesting from a research, research standpoint. But unfortunately, the people who are in the gym, the people you described who are looking at the television screens, and more importantly, people in the markets and people uh, watching financial news and and headline news and all the other news sources uh, are not thinking that way. Uh, they, they do understand at some level uh, that things aren't working. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, they think in headline numbers, right? And quite frankly, uh, from the standpoint of the markets who you would think would be very, very, market participants who you would think would be very, very sophisticated and be able to look beyond these headline numbers, uh, they're, they're really not. Uh, and in fact, markets trade based on these very, very broad and, and undefined uh, headline numbers. And so in, in fashioning the, the, the JQI, and we'll call it the JQI, because Job Quality Index takes a long time to say, um, the, in fashioning the JQI, what we wanted to do is go beyond just creating a little grain of salt with which to take the other data, but actually create a mountain of Himalayan rock salt, right? <laughs> to, to throw down and say, look, here's a new piece of easy to understand headline data. Uh, and, and this headline data will modify how you're thinking about the other data. Uh, it's a simple number. Uh, the, the, the job quality index itself is, is really the, uh, the ratio between uh, jobs that are at the north side of the, the mean average weekly wage and jobs below that. And the answer, the spoiler alert, I guess, is that they've been declining for 30 years. Not a big surprise. Um, so, you know, if you, if you looked at a perfectly balanced economy where half the jobs were high quality and half the jobs were low quality, the JQI would have a reading of 100. And back in, the, in 1990, it had a reading of 95 plus. Uh, and today it has a reading in the low 80s. Um, more importantly, it changes every single month. So we have a data point that we can put out in parallel uh, with the jobs announcements. Uh, and by doing so, we can say, okay, well, that's really wonderful uh, that we created X number of jobs or that the U3 unemployment rate is, 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 is declined. Uh, but at the end of the day, look at the quality of the jobs that we're making. So we have two data points that we put out. One is the job quality index itself, uh, which is a, a long-term intertemporal analysis, you know, going back 30 years. And the only reason that it's uh, 30 years is that's when the data is available from. We'd love to be able to go back farther, but the data is not sufficient to do so. Um, and, and it covers all production and non-supervisory workers. p and &S workers are about 83% of all workers. Uh, doing so eliminates, first of all, is we could only go back to 2000 if we covered all employees. But um, it not only gives us a broader uh, time frame, but it also 
removes some of the skew that you would see from the very top, you know, one percent of of, uh, of earners who would be in the all employees number. But even within that reduced base of 83% production and non-supervisory workers, you've seen this massive degradation in quality. Um, the second data point we put out is something called the JQ Instant, which is a little bit of a you know, sexy look, shiny, bright, shiny, shiny object number, which is basically to say, okay, well, since we have 180 sectors in the job quality index, and we know which sectors are producing low quality jobs and which sectors are producing high quality jobs, we can look at the jobs formed that very month, that hour after the numbers come out, and say how many of them were in the sectors that are low, lousy and how many of them are in the sectors that were good. We call that the JQ instant. It's a very simple snapshot analysis of the total private sector jobs that were gained or lost in a period. Um, and, and that number comes out. It's very, very digestible by the financial markets, as is the JQI. Uh, and that creates uh, a little bit of dialogue over, okay, it's very nice that we created 110,000 jobs, but are those 110,000 jobs coming from the right place, or are they just really more low-wage, lower jobs? But may I go on for just another minute? Yeah. Well, I want to ask you actually sure. on that because you've been saying this low wage, low hour jobs things. And I know one of the things that I, was striking to me when we were talking about this is the focus on hours, right? Because I think a lot of our conversation is on wage rate. What's right. the wage rate? What's the wage rate? And what you saw was a lot of the sort of driver of, um, of, of the de degradation in quality is due to the reduction in hours, which yeah. is really reducing so, people's income. Absolutely. And the other thing on that, I just want to give sure. a shout out to my colleagues in the financial security program who looking at this issue of hours looked at also the, not so it's not just low, fewer hours, but the less predictability of hours right. and the role of income volatility right. and sort of destabilizing people. So, right. so with, with respect to hours yes. work, Yes, we, we're looking at earnings. We're looking at weekly earnings. So obviously we're looking at wages times hours, right? Um, and yes, that is a huge, huge change. Over the last 50 years, uh, you had uh, the average number of hours worked was, you know, 50 years ago, about 33. Uh, and the cluster of hours was, you know, maybe plus or minus 10% off of that. Today, depending on which sectors you're talking about, the lowest sector, which is leisure and hospitality, offers an average of 25 hours a week. Think about that, okay? By the way, those are also some of the lowest wage jobs, right? So this, this is an enormous sector, 14 million people. Forget the state of Ohio. <laughs> this, is, this is a gigantic, or it wasn't Ohio. It was Iowa. Like, Iowa, it's <laughs> Iowa, sorry. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, th this is just an enormous cohort. If you look at four sectors in the economy, uh, healthcare and social assistance, retail, administrative and waste services, and leisure and hospitality. Those four sectors, the job growth in those four sectors equals almost to the penny the job loss in the manufacturing sector in America over the same period of time. And those four sectors are mammoth. And they have very low hours and they offer very low wages. Great, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, so now I kind of want us to move into a little bit about, um, you know, so what are uh, existing systems? But I want to talk a little bit more about sort of, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how things could be better utilized. Although, actually, I think the question I was going to um, uh, ask you, Heather, first before we get into this is really um, just to unpack a little bit more some of the, the inequality, because you've been highlighting sort of the, un, the unequal growth and sort of the, the degree to which it, the GDP, you know, very starkly illustrates um, sort of the where growth goes and where growth doesn't. But, uh, but, but could you comment a little bit more on other ways in which that's divided? And I'm particularly thinking about sort of women, people of color, younger cohorts, sort of what has been the experience of them in terms of these inequality numbers? And if you could just unpack that a little bit. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one of the exciting things is that we have um, access to so much more data that allows us to disaggregate it um, and look at different demographics and look across place. Um, I think it's always, it, it remains a little bit tough when you when you really want to slice and dice it too small. You can't do all the things you want to do because we just don't have the capacity. But, um, you know, the, the trends tend to, uh, confirm one's priors that uh, you know who's doing well and who is not. 
But, um, you know, in my slides, I feel like, you know, as, as I'm talking about the economy, I'm constantly sort of emphasizing that we need to disaggregate it. And then I'm not showing slides that break it down for all the different different graphic groups. I'm looking across income groups, sort of knowing that those income groups are um, composed of different kinds of people. And so that is sort of the next layer of iteration that we always need to keep at the forefront. One of the most exciting things that's been happening in economics and um, if you follow the news coverage each January when the um, big econ conference happens, there's always a few articles about this in the days and weeks after. But over the past three to five years, um, there's been a lot of attention to the role of um, women and people of color within the profession. So this year was the 50th anniversary of the National Economics Association, which is sort of the traditional sort of black um, economist um, professional organization inside the sort of the major umbrella of, of economists and um, really thinking about um, inclusion, the lack thereof in, in economics has been a big theme. I could go on and on about it, but it does feel, it, I mean, there is a lot of, um, people are trying to make a lot of progress on that. Mm -hmm. And I say that because there's also actual research evidence that if you have different people doing economics, they ask different questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's evidence that the kinds of people that choose to um, do research on particular communities um, are different than those that study other things. And so the extent to which we have an economics profession that is much more diverse plays into our ability to do better policy. Mm -hmm. And it also plays into the kinds of research questions that are being asked. And so I just wanted to use this yeah. as a moment on the disaggregation that both it's about the data, but it's also about making sure that we have space for that. Mm -hmm. Just like who invents things, who's yeah. asking the questions is, is really important. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, that's that's really great. There was another follow-up question I was going to ask you, but I'll think of it later and come back to it. Um, <laughs> and Dan, because, uh, you know, so, but I wanted to get that on the table because we do think a lot about these divides by uh, race and gender and how important that is. Um, and Dan, I kind of want to come to you and sort of say, you know, in looking at job quality, right, it, it is, I get it's a big national measure and you're kind of talking to a national audience that, I guess I gather is not you know sort of looking at the fine details all as often as we might hope they might be, but um, but we also know like across the country sort of regional economies are are different, and so I'm just curious sort of how you're thinking about um, how people might think about how to, job quality in their area and and what the index might say to that. Yeah, so there's two uh, cuts that we're looking at the data. One is regional, and the other one is industry uh, super sectors. Um, we're, we're right now, uh, I'm working on a, a project in healthcare and social assistance uh, to sort of demonstrate and the, the, the answers. We already know the answer, but we're, we need to do the, the numbers a little bit more heavily um, to demonstrate that the number within that super sector, the number of jobs has drifted towards the lower paying uh, categories. Not surprisingly, hospitals have been staffing up with more and more lower paid workers doing tasks that could be uh, mechanized, could be automated, could be made more efficient, uh, but but they don't want to invest the, the capital necessary to do so. So, and then the massive uh, increase in the, so, in the social assistance sector has also affected that. So looking at that, that's a very interesting analysis. Regionally, um, from just a pure quantitative side, uh, if you did this with, say, California, you would have a very, very good, reliable number because of the diversity of the economy. Uh, it's not all concentrated in one industry, uh, and because of the uh, the size of the economy. If you got down to try to do this in Rhode Island or Delaware, it's a meaningless number, to be quite honest. Um, and so while we're, while, while, and especially in any state, you know, if, if I did, I, I haven't done it, but I'd be curious to do it in Washington State. It's so dominated by Boeing that, that uh, well, maybe not anymore. Uh, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, but the, you know, the, it historically has been that you would see this you know, incredible skew relative to the rest of the country. Um, so it's difficult, I think, at mm -hmm. some level to, to look at this unless you have a very diversified large economy. Okay, and um, Sapna, I wanna come to you and just sort of ask you uh, kind, of, kind of two questions. One is, I, I know these issues of sort of race, gender, and place and how that influences things um, is something that you all think a lot. So if you wanna comment on that, um, please please do. Um, but also, I'm just curious, sort of with this, you know, your work on inflation inequality, kind of, um, you know, are there further questions that you're trying to think about? Or, or what's next as you start to think about how can, how can this concept really be used more broadly? 
Yeah, um, just to your, to your first question, I think you know, the mainstream narrative really says that the solution to wage gaps, occupational segregation by race and gender is you know, for women, people of color to, to lean in, work harder, negotiate harder. Um, you know, and it puts the blame on the individual, right, instead of the systems um, of power that are at play. Um, but really, like, if the most marginalized people are, are succeeding in our economy, um, not to sound like a broken record, but, you know, our, then our economy is not working, right? And when the economy centers the most marginalized, all of us benefit. And I think that, you know, well, well data is not everything, right, because who is included in the data is also um, a function of power. The data is important, right, because it helps elevate um, the scope of the systemic inequities and really surface that and, um, you know, to the extent that the measurement of a problem can lead to, to better solutions. Um, and then just on the inflation and equality piece, I think, you know, that data does a, does a great job of really backing up many of the things that we know to be true about how our economy works, like how systems work, um, you know, how people's lives work, how, how systems and structures um, affect people's day to day. And so we, um, you know, basically, right, like inequality is so bad that, that rich people are so rich that they're literally creating this two-tiered market structure um, that is hurting lower and middle income families. They have so much money, um, you know, that they don't know what to do with because they are taking it from the rest of us, right? And that's what's <laughs> making our economy worse off. Um, and so I think, you know, it's not just that progressive policies are right morally, but they're also good for the economy, right? Like this data bolsters our argument um, that we do need to do things differently and we have to talk about structural change and, and fundamentally change how our economy works. Um, like, so at Groundwork, like, we are really focused on disabusing folks of, like, the notion that the economy is great because the stock market, um, you know, is doing well or, or GDP is high or even not so high. Um, but the real question is, like, well, how, how are real people doing, right? Like, how is your family doing? How is my family doing? Um, and, like, that should be the measurement to really assess how the, you know, if the economy is doing well. Um, I think that was really our goal in, in digging into inflation inequality. Yeah. Great. So Heather, I want to um, close this up by asking with you about, um, so you described the distributed national accounts and you said, wouldn't it be great if you're at the gym on your treadmill and like they were talking about this picture rather than that picture, which I could relate to. I'd be like, okay, good. I wouldn't have to get off my treadmill and like exactly. do something more interesting. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, so, but what does it take us to get there, right? I, what, what, what does it take to sort of change this conversation and to actually have government agencies put out something a little different? Well, so we have been working on this for years. Yes. <laughs> and um, we're really excited um, that a couple of months ago, the Bureau of Economic Analysis put a note up on their website oh. saying that the pilot of this, not using national income, which is what we want, not releasing it on the same day as the national income and product accounts, which they have to do, but the pilot, the first cut, which will be released the day after the um, sort of the because it'll be using personal income, um, will first will be um, first launched in March. Yay! So yeah, really um, cool. we so if you want to know about that, please feel free to you know give me or my colleague your your email, and we will put you on our lists, and um, we can make sure that you um, are aware of that. Um, so that's very exciting. Also, in the, um, in the legislation that got through Congress at the end of the year that funded the government, um, there is a million dollars that has been allocated to the Bureau of Economic Analysis to conduct this research. Um, and it has been the case for um, quite for a while now. Congress has been, um, uh, now there's, a, I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but there's various levels when Congress asks the statistical agencies to do something. There's like some words that they use where they have to do it, and some words that they use like it'd be really, really nice if you did this. And so they use the the softer version of the words where they sort of encourage Congress. And then the BA has done this. So Congress has been just a, a wonderful partner, and um, people on the Hill have been incredibly excited. Um, I, I've testified about this twice now, um, and both times there were the Republican witnesses also um, agreed that getting this kind of data would be a good thing. So um, uh, it feels like something that, that really could generate some uh, cross-team collaboration, shall we say. Um, so, uh, so we're very excited that we'll be having some of this soon. There's still more work to be done, but 
but excited to have these first steps. That's great. People don't always say Congress has been a terrific partner. So. Uh, you know, we've, we've been, <laughs> it's been just a real joy for us. <laughs> that is really great news. Well, I'm going to ask them one more sort of very quick round of, I'll ask them to be quick on this round and, and want to get you into the conversation. Um, so, and if you're on Twitter, please, our hashtag is talk opportunity. So tweet us questions as well. Um, but I'm going to go to just sort of, sort of a quick few thoughts on uh, how do different measures lead us to act differently. Um, Dan, I'll start with you and looking at the job quality index, you know, sort of if you think about uh, if people actually paid attention to it, um, what, would, what would people do differently? What would you want to see, say, policymakers do differently if they're tracking the job quality index? Well, obviously the key is not more low-wage, low-hour jobs, right? There's been a lot of talk about minimum wage. There's been a lot of talk about pushing things up from below. The answer is more high-wage, high-hour jobs, right? And so we need policy to accommodate that. Um, uh, the, the simple answer is if the private sector is not going to create those jobs, which it hasn't been for many years, uh, we need the other actor in our economy, which is the public sector, uh, to do that. And uh, the answer there traditionally has been infrastructure, but there are other answers as well. Um, the, the idea of, uh, uh, of the public sector being a greater force in the economy to offset what has been a multi-decade uh, history of, of, uh, of, of government austerity is, is clearly the answer. I just want to say one other thing because it, it's not fair to my partners. This project was a, a multi-institutional project, which was a cooperation between uh, Cornell University, where I'm a fellow and, and an adjunct, and uh, it, was, it, it was led also by the Coalition for a Prosperous America, which is a bipartisan organization focused on manufacturing and labor, uh, and uh, also by the University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, and uh, the, the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Uh, so I just wanted to get that out there, and jobqualityindex.com. Great, great. Always good to thank our partners. Um, Sapna, what, uh, for you, what kind of policy change, kind of in brief, would uh, best be addressed by the, or uh, would inflation inequality take us to? Yeah. So, I mean, I will talk a little bit about a rubric for evaluating policies that we've been thinking about at Groundwork. Um, so, an outsized of you know amount of inequality means there's an outsized amount of power at the top. And so, first off, our policies have to curb um, you know excessive concentrations of private power. Secondly, they have to expand public power and increase public investment um, because the public sector is, is really the only, um, as, as Dan was alluding to, is really the only mechanism we have to do some of the foundational things like increasing worker productivity that the economy needs. Um, and it's the only way that we can effectively check um, corrosive consequences um, of a mass private power. And then this third piece is, is also critical, um, is that you know, policies have to be inclusive and equitable. Um, like we we can't have an economy that's you know maybe just like a little bit less unequal than than what we have now, um, you know. But but there's still like gender and racial disparities, um, and so I think if like we're really thinking along these levels, um, policies that combat inequality should really do all of these things. Great. And Heather, is there sort of? I mean, I know you have lots of policy ideas. So is there just one that you want to talk about that you hope a conversation around sort of distributed national accounts would be? you know, make people think more seriously about this policy to address the issue. Yeah, so I think that our hope is that, I mean, at the most, at the, at the most important level, if you change the way, I mean, as you said in your opening, if you, you know, change the metric, you change what you're managing to. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I think it's really important that whatever new metrics we want policymakers and the public to be watch to be watching, they and what, the reason that I like this disaggregated natural and I think there are other things that want to come up. But the reason that I think it's so powerful is it it is a unique metric and it connects the dots between our traditional ways of measuring economic progress and the things that happen to people and families. It provides us something that that puts those into one metric together. So as an, as an economist who's been uh, doing sort of the, the public economics for decades now, you know, there's some days where I talk about economics and I'm in some rooms and we're talking about very important things like the macro economy and we're using aggregate statistics and rarely does anybody mention anything about people or families or different communities. 
And then there's other um, rooms that I'm in where we're talking about people and families and we want to know what's happening across race or gender, dem all these things. We have a jobs day where we have the unemployment data, but that's on a different day than the day when we talk about <laughs> GDP and national income because those are somehow disconnected. And I think what, the, what this indicator does is it, it's, it, it's mind blowing because like, whoa, those are the same thing, which this, you all have been saying they're the same yeah. thing, but we need to actually show people these are the same thing. And that opens up all sorts of new policy discussions because then you really are going to say to government, well, okay, if you do something just to pick on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and there's so many fun policies, but just to pick <laughs> on that one. So if you do that, and then you know, in the quarters after that, President Trump was saying, look, the economy is doing so good. Growth is up. And we were sitting there going, well, yeah, but all that growth is going to dividends. It's all going to those at the very, very top. We need a metric that shows that to the American people so they don't have to read 12 different newspaper articles, but that we're putting that together in one coherent story. So my hope is, is that in doing that, people all across America will understand the economy in a different way. And we won't have to have two separate conversations. We have one conversation and bring men and women together, talk about the economy at the same time, all sorts of people. Great, great. Thank you. So this is OK, great. So we do have people with microphones. So I'm going to go one, two, three right here, just down this little line. And um, uh, I'll take three at once. And then um, okay. uh, my name is Mike Golash. Uh, one of the metrics you seem to have left off, or I don't know if maybe you haven't talked about it today, is that unionization rates. Mm -hmm. If you look at unionization rates starting in 1950, comparing with today, there's been a steady downcline. And I think you can almost measure that as a way also of a decline in real wages. And then there's second, even within those metrics, you look a little deeper and see the workers who have the right to strike as opposed to workers who mm -hmm. do not. And that's a different metric also. And I think you'll see that those who do not have the right to strike will have a sharper <laughs> decline. So I think you know those type of metrics have to be made more public and thought about in a more clear way by people. So I'd just like to hear your comments on that. Great, thank you. There's a gentleman, right, yeah, right there. Okay. Thank you for your observations. Um, I wonder if any of the panelists have looked at the data in the context of the developments post-World War I until 1945, because what you've described almost mirrors uh, mutatis mutandis, those events. The two questions I have in particular, the, the byline of the presentation was inequality constricts economy. And if in fact we're trending more in the direction of an inequality type of world, a la Mad Max and Thunderdome environment, uh, we might very easily find that those who have had to live with inequality the longest can navigate in that environment far better than those who've been living with uh, privilege and a perception of equality based on dollar signs. So my question is, do we have a way of finding out whether we're trending more in the direction of inequality or equality? And the second question I have is, as I was listening to all of you, the, in the background, in the back of my mind were images of Australia burning. And um, my question, and, and it was like I was looking at a micro uh, event, micro uh, uh, weather event in the context of our conversation. Because if a global climate change is not factored into all of these economic data, everything we're talking about becomes irrele irrelevant in the next 10 years, if we can even make it that far. And I would like your observations to that as well. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, this one. Thank you all. And actually, my question relates to the, the very last one that was asked. And in particular, um, I know, Heather, thank you so much for your work. But um, if you could speak to maybe if you've had a sense of the limits of addressing inequality from a lens of growth, uh, in part grappling with climate and other questions, but also maybe in other regards, um, whether there's more to be said or opportunities to say more. OK, great. So we have uh, unionization. We have uh, historical uh, periods. Um, we have who can cope in an unequal world, or are we really going that way? And then the climate change. Um, we kind of have a couple of questions related to to climate change and, and inequality. So, uh, you want to start? I'll start with the unionization question. Okay. To speak a little bit about the second one. Yeah. So, so yeah, clearly, uh, unionization is a, 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 a key factor in all of this. But I think underlying that, yet yeah, you need to look broader, more broadly down to the political level. 
the states that are right to work states, right, which is obviously where the, the rubber meets the road in all this, uh, are states in which you have a political consensus or that political consensus has been accepted, uh, meaning through the election of state legislatures, legislators and so forth, um, that, that effectively deprives the unions of their, their ability to collectively bargain and organize. Um, that factor, right, is a factor, in my opinion, and I think it's borne out by the data that we've done, uh, that you have an increasing desperation for employment, right? People are willing to take whatever's fallen off the truck, so to speak, uh, in, terms, in terms of jobs. And the worse that condition gets in a given state, right, the, the worse the, uh, the, the, the employment situation gets in a given state, the less uh, uh, there's a propensity to, to uh, uh, back unions. Um, one thing I'll say about, about the job quality index particularly, but also just as a point, a general point in terms of how to look at this world. You know, a lot of people are very tempted, and I think the people up on this panel would, would agree with me, to look at everything from the standpoint of the worker, how are workers faring, how are families faring, all this. The job quality index took a different approach. We actually wanted to look at the inventory of jobs on offer. Basically, what are employers giving us? Right, and I think that's that's a very important distinction to make because you can you can talk about how workers are doing, and it's certainly very very important. You can talk about how much of the pie they're getting and so forth, but you know at the end of the day, it's all driven by what jobs are available, uh, and uh, and and that's what you know that that's the the work that that we did, and I think you know it, it fits very beautifully with the work the other work that's been done by people on this stage. Yeah, I really appreciate that point because I think one of the things we've been thinking about also is is to look at sort of what's on offer and and how it changes, right? Because it's not you can make different choices about how you design jobs as a company. Yeah. So, um, Sapna, you wanted to get in, and I know Heather wanted to get in too. So. Just to to build on that point, I mean, I, I do think right unionization is critical to strengthening job quality. We have to strengthen collective bargaining laws. Um, you know, unions, while, while certainly not perfect and also have, you know, a legacy of racism, really help to address racial disparities, right, particularly improving outcomes for black workers. Um, so I think that's critical. I would just mention a couple other policies like workplace policies like paid sick days and paid family leave, right, that ensure working people don't have to make the impossible choice between, you know, their or their family's health and their paycheck, fair scheduling practices, as Maureen mentioned, to ensure that, you know, everybody has stable, predictable schedules to ensure that they can, you know, make ends meet and care for their families. Um, you know, and just updating, strengthening equal pay laws, anti-discrimination, um, and anti-harassment laws as well. Well, and so I'll, I'll tackle this climate change, um, this climate question, or the, the couple of them. I mean, I think that this is, um, this is a really important question. Um, one, one thing that I believe, um, and, um, and this is something that we talk a lot about at my office, um, that if we want to address, in order to address the climate challenge, that's got to work through politics. And given what we know about the effects of economic inequality on political outcomes, that will require that we also deal with the inequality issue. Um, that these are not, um, these are twin problems. They're not separate. Um, and in many ways, I think the, um, you know, many of the challenges that we see in the political process around these are the direct result of the rising economic inequality, the way that plays out. And there's a lot of um, sort of, there's political science research that connects the dots between these different pieces of the, the puzzle. So I think it's really important to, to start there. I think it's also important, um, and you know, as I've, as I've talked about these issues over the years at Equitable Growth, I've, there's, uh, it's, it's always good to get this question about, you know, is, is growth the outcome? Is that, what, is that what we're going for? Like, what are we going for? Um, we really focus on the disaggregation of growth because it makes you ask that question without saying we're just going to go to a new metric of success. So it says here's the metric you're looking at. It doesn't actually mean what you think it did, right? And it, it doesn't mean what it used to. That opens up all sorts of new places for us to have a national conversation about what it is that we're going for. And maybe along, down the line we need a new metric of success. But, um, you know, I was very, uh, you know, I've been in many, many conversations over the years, as I know many of you have been, about changing the government statistical, um, the, the, the measures that our government statistical agencies use 
And what I've seen is that those are a really awesome full employment program for statisticians and economists and social scientists. And we get to go to a lot of conferences, and we keep talking <laughs> about it, and then we talk about it, and then we, we talk about it more, and then nothing. And then it's incredibly difficult to make them into law because there's all this path dependency, and there's always the opportunity for somebody to essentially concern troll. Well, I don't know if we change this metric. One of the things, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go off on a second on this, because okay. one of the things about the disaggregating growth that, so GDP is, an, is a metric that we came up with nearly a century ago that is super flawed. There's all these problems with it. You know that, that metric is released, and it is revised at least five times. And sometimes there's huge revisions. But nobody talks about that. It's totally fine. As we, I'm like yelling here because it's so frustrating to me. As we've been talking about this new metric, like let's just disaggregate it. I got all these statisticians and these very, and I, I mean, people that I love, the wonderful people, but they're very concerned that once we, if we add on the income distribution, they're concerned that we're going to have to revise it. What the, are you Oops. kidding me? Yes, you already revised this metric, but the new metrics, the metrics that connect the dots are being held to a higher standard. And this is the thing, I feel like I've sat in gazillions of hours of my life have been spent in meetings where we talk about different metrics and, and somebody is making perfect to the enemy of the good. The reason that I'm so excited about the work that we've been doing at Equitable Growth and the reason we've devoted so many resources to it is because it's, we already have the data. Government already has the data. We already released this data in different forms. We're just putting it together. So it's, it'll be much easier to get to that next level so that we can have the conversation that you are asking us to have. Um, so it's like, how do you make those incremental steps that'll, that'll lead to the changes that you really need to see without, you know, the Stiglitz um, Fatusi Commission, that came out, what, a decade ago now? About changing, you know, and incorporating climate change into GDP. Well, we haven't made, we in the United States haven't made progress, so let's find different ways. But I, I think that, you, that I'm so glad that somebody always brings that up because that, what you are asking is the most important question. We all know that climate change, like this is the existential crisis, but how we get through politics and the current economy to get there, that's what we're trying to help. That's our piece of the puzzle. Okay, so this is what you all came for, right? People who can talk so passionately about <laughs> economic statistics, right? And, you know, sort of truth in advertising here, okay, this is why I love these people, right? Because I'm actually married to a research economist at the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Oh, yes. So, uh, oh, yeah, boy. I love this conversation. Um, so, anyway, I saw... Sorry, Marie, can I say... So right sorry, can I just to piggyback on what Heather <laughs> said, right? Um, so, I think we've talked a lot about, you know, the impact on institution, like, institutions that are supposed to regulate our markets and constrain inequality. Um, and I just think the idea of, like, looking at different metrics for success is, is very interesting because there may be some things that actually, you know, should, should be outside markets. Um, you know, and I think that's where public power comes in. Okay. I was going to recite a poem on night. I, I, I want to take a couple of questions. So, <laughs> so I, uh, this woman here, and this woman here, and the gentleman way in the back. Okay. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cosleon from Community Change. My question is for Heather. In the beginning of the panel, and first of all, thank you all so much for for this very interesting conversation. At the beginning of the panel, you mentioned this impetus to try to understand why our economy doesn't deliver the way it used to. And I think for many communities of color, if you ask them, they would say our economy never delivered for them. And so my question is around this disaggregation of growth by income, whether your suggestion is also to disaggregate the data by race, by gender, by place, by educational attainment. Mm -hmm. and whether our economy is better or worse for women of color and people of color than it was 30, 40 years ago. Okay, that's just, um, and one here. Hi, um, my name's Elena. I'm a senior at AU, and I also am an intern at the Democracy Collaborative. Um, I'm from a pretty small town in Georgia, and whenever I come back to DC, uh, for whatever reason, I always get trapped in this kind of progressive bubble. And then when I return home, I try and talk to like my family or my grandparents or um, a lot of just anyone who will listen. Um, <laughs> they immediately disagree. So I guess my question would be, how do you communicate these new emerging ideas to people who are stuck in the status quo and are closed off to new ideas like this? Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, we've been uh, 
there have been some critiques of uh, things that measure the aggregate economy. Uh, and there are a lot of studies that say that immigration uh, is a net plus for the aggregate economy, but then proponents of strict uh, controls or reductions in immigration say that immigration has reduced the wages of a lot of Americans and increased inequality. Uh, so is there any, just from an economic perspective, is there any evidence on that? Okay. So, uh, we have some questions Lots on disaggregation, of race, and gender. Uh, the communications question to people who don't live and breathe this all the time, and uh, uh, immigration questions. Why don't we have so. Heather tackle the one that was for Heather? Yeah, I'll, I'll start there. And um, uh, so, so certainly, I mean, I think that you know when I say it didn't, it doesn't deliver the way it used to. Showing those original charts where we were a nation that was growing together. Um, and now we are a nation that is that is not, certainly is not, I did not disaggregate that particular chart by race and by gender. It's actually, that's from tax return data, so we actually can't do it with that. Um, but we do know that, you know, over the period, especially since the, the 1960s, there was more coming together, and a lot of that stopped in the 1990s or so um, uh, uh, for different demographic groups. So um, it, is an important, um, it is an important question to ask. It's also um, possible um, when the government does this disaggregated growth, it, it, it should be possible for them to disaggregate it by a cross place and for different demographic groups. But it's sort of, there's some methodological issues to, to work out because the way that the academics who developed the idea did it, um, they connected the dots between the tax data and the national income products account, and we don't have all of the demographic breakdowns in the tax data, although you do have regional. So um, some things are possible right now and some things aren't, but it's certainly something that people are talking about. I also think it's really important to continually, um, as we're thinking about the conversations around inclusion, to not lose sight of that, um, the third chart that I showed, that the vast majority of gains in our economy have been going to those at the very, very, very top. And that that is really the most important. I mean, there's a lot of important statistics. There's a lot of important conversations you need to have about inequality. But the ways that that incredibly high economic concentration of incomes is connected to the concentration across firms, is connected to the concentration across race, that that is primarily a white group and disproportionately male in terms of the earners is an important piece of the puzzle, but it's also just important to know how that's affecting our economy and how that's affecting communities um, and who's benefiting. But I, just one point on the how we communicate it, I think, um, not to sort of belabor this, but I do think that the reason that I like um, thinking about starting from GDP is it's a measure that the people in your community already know about. So you're not asking them to come up with something new, but how can, if you show them a different story about what that statistic means, if that's what's going to be on their news, if that's what's going to come up on their news feeds on social media, will that make people ask different questions? Because I mean, your experience, and I think many of us that have that come from families or go to places all across America, how you communicate means that a lot of time it is listening and helping people sort of um, uh, hear, you know, hearing what they have to say, but um, helping them to see things in a different way through conversation. And so if you can give people new tools to do that, that allow us to start the conversation in a different place, that seems like at least one bite at the apple. Great. Yeah. Can I tackle yep. mm -hmm. a couple of these? So with respect to immigration, and then I want to get back to Elena, who asked a great question. Um, you know, yeah, sure, in a, in a small enough region, it is possible <laughs> to point to immigration as having some negative effects. Nationwide, it's almost impossible. There's no real convincing study that nationwide uh, immigration is a threat to, to labor in general. What we have a, is, right now is a far larger threat, and that is something that my I and others call virtual immigration. And virtual immigration really amounts to this massive exogenous workforce around the globe effectively taking the, the jobs of producing what we consume. So whether they're here or whether they're there, uh, it, 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 is, it is less of a factor than the fact that we have this massive excess of labor relative to aggregate demand for consumption. Um, and the biggest problem isn't, them, isn't people coming across the border. It's the goods that are being shipped across the border uh, that, that are the big problem. If I may have a moment to just address you, Elena. You sh Thank sure, because this is last comment. Okay. So. <laughs> let, 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 listen, um, talking to the, the, the Jeffersonian, Jacksonian side of this country, 
is very, very difficult if you're a progressive. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I'm sorry, talking to the Jeffersonian, Jacksonian side of this country is difficult. It's been done before. It was done during the Great Depression. The first thing you have to do is start with how you doing and what do you think's wrong with this country, right? You can play from there. You don't have to stand there advocating progressive ideas. What you have to do is understand things from the standpoint of where they see the weaknesses. Then you can do what is quite frankly, very difficult to do, which is to emphasize that government isn't the enemy, that government can actually help. And that's really how you address this. It was done by Franklin Delano Roosevelt with great effect. Keep in mind, you had a Democratic Party at that point that was fundamentally racist in the South, and yet they joined with progressives to restore this country. So don't feel like you have to sell the progressive idea Right? Talk to them and talk to them from where they sit. Find out what they think is going wrong and tell them that Ronald Reagan wasn't right when he said the nine most scary words anyone ever said were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And add some time three times a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sapna, do you want any, to share any final thoughts? Just, just real quick, I want to, just to the woman from Community Change, I mean, right, we know the New Deal left out domestic workers, it left out farm workers, like black and brown workers did not see the, the same like gains as their white counterparts during, um, you know, during that time. And so I do think it's, it's like, it's critical, I mean, it's critical, I can't even think of a stronger word, right? Like race and, and, and gender have to be sent, like have to be centered in our policy making. Um, and then just like, I think one thing that continues to like, you know, be an impediment in our ability to really like move past a neoliberal economic framework is that that framework really plays into like the American mythology of, of what it takes to be successful, right? Like that narrative doesn't incorporate misogyny or, or racism or classism or power, like all of which are very real in our society and economy. But like, and this narrative is, is very ingrained in people's minds, like even progressives when they articulate how the economy works, like fall into that framework. Um, you know, so it is tough, but I will say like from our polling and our message testing, like we, we see that like people do respond very positively to progressive policy. And even when you like do center, you know, race um, and gender. And so, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's gonna be tough, but like it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely doable. Great, thank you. That's an optimistic point yeah. to end on. <laughs> thank you all so much and let's thank our panel. I'm sorry we couldn't take all the questions, but really appreciate you being here. Uh, join us again March 20th when we'll be talking about employee ownership and its potential to address uh, racial and gender wealth gaps. What a wonderful